Welcome to Heart of the Shepherd for today's daily Bible devotional and Bible study. Our scripture reading today continues in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 22 and 23. Well, I've titled this devotional, Is This the End? Now, I'm actually going to break them up into two devotionals, however, only one video for today. Well, what a joy it is to continue looking at this prophetic judgment that is directed to in chapter 22 and verse 1 as the valley of the vision. Now, because Judah was identified as the object of the prophecy in verse 8, and the city of David is named as the subject of a siege in verse 9, we know that Isaiah 22 is a prophecy against Jerusalem. And so consider with me Isaiah 22 and verse 1 through 7. And here we have God's judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. Judah being the southern kingdom consisting of two tribes, the tribe of Judah primarily, and within the midst of it, the tribe of Benjamin. Now, having witnessed the devastation that was suffered by Israel, because this prophecy now is, is coming after we look to the north, the ten tribes have been overrun by Assyria. They've been taken captive. Really, the northern ten tribes on this Israel is no more. Well, Judah in the south has witnessed the devastation of that loss, and the, and, and the brethren, the brother tribes to the north, are no more. And you would hope that the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, would repent and humble themselves before God. But instead, we read concerning Jerusalem in verse 2, Thou that art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Now think about that. The Jews are aware that Samaria, the capital of, of Israel to the north, all the northern tribes have been taken away. There's been a huge slaughter, devastation, uh, loss of life. And what does Jerusalem do? No, they continue in their sin like they always have. And they're full of noise and shouting. A joyous city really is indicative of a jubilant or a city full of revelers. Think about uh, some major city on uh, maybe uh, New Year's Eve and the celebration and the drunkenness. That is what Jerusalem was. Well, the citizens of Jerusalem then, you see, they mirrored the sinful, selfish spirit of the rich fool in the Gospel of Luke, where we read, the, he says to himself, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, the people had taken pleasure in their sins, rejected the warning that God's judgment was imminent. So Isaiah warned the people that the day of judgment was coming and men would be slain in the streets, Isaiah 22 and verse 2. And yet the leaders of the people... Though they would flee before the enemy, nevertheless, they did not prepare themselves for the day of judgment. And then notice, if you would, chapter 22 and verses 8 through 14. And here we really have the answer to the question of why. What is the cause for God's judgment? And the refusal of the people to humble themselves. And so this is very instructive. Yes, it's uh, uh, you know 2,800 years ago, but still we can learn the heart of man in this because the heart of man has not changed. And so Isaiah prophesied in verses 8 through 11 that Jerusalem's defenses would fail and still the people refused to turn to the Lord in verse 11. Instead of repenting of their sin, again, verses 12 through 14, the resolve of the people was eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Well, of Judah, the Lord declared, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts, in verse 14. In other words, the die was cast. Judgment was coming. It was too late for Judah. Now, there's a specific denunciation of Jerusalem's treasurer that is found in chapter 22 and verses 15 through 19. Now, this is particularly interesting uh, Interesting because it really, it, the treasurer, I think in many ways, mirrors 
the culture of Washington, D.C., or Toronto, Canada, or London, uh, or Berlin, Germany, and the list goes on and on, uh, where people of power have enriched themselves. You know, here in the United States, you can elect a politician. They can go to Washington with maybe $300,000 at the bank, and within a few years, they're worth millions. How does that happen? Well, you know how it happens. They are like Shebna. Now, who is that? Look with me at Isaiah 22 and verse 15. The Lord commanded Isaiah to take a personal message of judgment to the treasurer of Jerusalem named Shebna. Now, like politicians of our day, Shebna had enriched himself with ill-gotten gain. Now, flaunting his wealth, we read that he had carved out of rock an elaborate sepulcher, a grave worthy of a king in verse 16. So Isaiah warned the treasurer that he would be carried away and die in captivity, and his tomb would belong to another. And yet God in his mercy raised up Eliakim. Here we have that prophecy, who would be a godly leader, chapter 22 and verses 20 through 25. And so replacing Shebna, the Lord promised he would raise Eliakim, a man whom he described as, quote, my servant. Now, unlike Shebna, who abused the trust of the people and his position, we read about Eliakim that he conducted himself like, and I quote, a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. In other words, like a father desires to provide for his family and self-sacrifice, so it was for Eliakim. Well, he proved, verse 22, that he was an honorable man. And we read in verse 23 that the Lord placed on him, or promised Eliakim, he would serve like, and I quote, a nail in a sure place. In other words, a man that was appointed exactly for where God had him, a nail that is well placed. Well, he would, Eliakim, bring the glory of of his father's house. In other words, as you would look at Eliakim, he would be a wonderful testimony for his father's house. Well, a closing thought for this, the first of two devotionals combined into one today. For Judah, verse 25, it was too late. Now, though Eliakim was a godly man, is serving at the forefront of Judah's leadership, God's judgment was inevitable. Now, you and I looking at our world today, I wonder if it is too late for many nations to escape God's judgment, like the people of Judah. You know, I fear there are many believers in churches that have assimilated the sins and the pleasures of the world, and they've given little thought to the promise of God's judgment. May you and I determine that we will not serve for the pleasure of wealth or possessions, only to hear, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Now consider with me just briefly, if you would, the second devotional that we find here today and just combining them all into one video devotion. And so uh, as we look at the scriptures, we have now in Isaiah 23, what I would describe as the judgment day, the judgment day. Now the prophet Isaiah's message of judgment now continues and the subject is, and I quote, verse 1 of chapter 23 of Isaiah, quote, the burden of Tyre. Now, the word burden, as we've often reminded you, is the word for judgment. Now, Isaiah 23, notice if you would, verses 1 through 6, the pronouncement of judgment against Tyre. Now, several ancient seaport cities were named in the opening verses of Isaiah 23. By Isaiah's day, the seaport city known as Tyre was inhabited for centuries and was a very important seaport for trade. Now, Isaiah foretold the desolation that Tyre would suffer, and he declared that it would be, quote, laid waste so that there is no house no entering. In other words, no inhabitants. The bustling harbor city would fall silent. Now, because Tyre was a center for trade and commerce, Isaiah 23 and verses 2 through 3, its fall would impact the entire region financially. 
Now, Isaiah prophesied that the ships of Tarshish, now Tarshish was ancient Spain, what we know today is modern Spain. And so we read, Isaiah prophesied that the ships of Spain, the ships of Tarshish, would howl or wail for attire, the collapse, the destruction, the devastation of the seaport. Now, the news of Tyre's fall would reach another place, and it's the land of Chittim, which is probably Cyprus, obviously an island in the Mediterranean Sea. And then Zidon, or Sidon, an ancient Phoenician seaport located on north of ancient Tyre, and Sihar, uh, probably today's Egypt, uh, would all be diminished. Why? Because of destruction of Tyre. Now we read in verse 5, now remember Egypt was the breadbasket of the ancient world. And yet Egypt now with the collapse and the fall of Tyre, we read in verse 5, would be sorely pained at the report of Tyre, probably one of the markets to which the Egyptians shipped their grain. Now, uh, we also read in verse 6 that pursued by the Babylonian army, the refugees of Tyre would flee to Tarsus, to Spain. Now, a couple of questions we should ask as we study today. The first would be, why and who conquered Tyre? Why was Tyre appointed for judgment? Now look at verse 7. Now the answer to that is this, and I quote again, verse 7. Is this your joyous city? Remember, that's how Jerusalem was referred to. Is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient day? You reach back many, many centuries. Tyre, now speaking of her, her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. In other words, the idea that the city would be left desolate, vacant in verse 7. So Tyre, to put it in more modern terms, was wealthy like Vienna of the Middle Ages or modern London, Washington, and some of the other capitals of the world in modern times. And so Tyre's wealth had turned the population of that city into a rich, quote again, joyous, again, frivolous, narcissistic, self-serving city. And we read the sins and wickedness of Tyre provoked God's wrath. Now that's the who and the why. Now the or why. Now the who. Who devastated Tyre? Isaiah 23 and verses 8 through 14. Now the scriptures in history record the Babylonian invasion as the instrument of Tyre's destruction. But the scriptures are very clear. They leave no doubt that the fall of Tyre was the work of the Lord. And so we read. Quote, verse 9 and verse 11. The Lord of hosts hath purposed it. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. So the Babylon, uh, Babylon was the instrument. It was God who had determined that Tyre should be destroyed. And so Tyre's annihilation as a city and people then affected other towns and strongholds on the Mediterranean Sea. The demise of Assyria gave rise to Babylon and still... Isaiah prophesied the Chaldeans, again, the nation which Babylon was the capital city, by the way, verse 13 of Isaiah 23, that Babylon would also be judged by the Lord. Again, this is the fourth telling. You might destroy Tyre, you might destroy Jerusalem, but you yourself, Babylon, will be judged. And in that day, we read in verse 14, the sailors from Tarshish would wail and howl for the devastating economic loss they would experience. And then a prophecy again. Isaiah 23 and verses 15 through 17. 70 years later, after Tyre is destroyed, it will be rebuilt. Now, though all seem lost, for Tyre, Isaiah made an amazing prophecy in verse 15. The 70 years would pass. At the end of the 70 years, Tyre would, quote, verse 15, sing as a harlot. Now, how could that be? The city has been destroyed. Babylon rules the world. You know, but the Bible reveals that history affirms that in 70 years, the Chaldean nation ceased to exist when Babylon, its capital city, overnight 
fell to the Medes and Persian empires. We'll study that in the future in Daniel chapter 5. Well, Tyre, that wicked city was revived only to return to her sinful ways. And so once again, verse 16 and 17 of Isaiah, we uh, read again that the kingdoms of the world would be enticed to her alluring wicked ways. Well, closing thought, the pronouncement of God's judgment of Tyre ends with a prophecy that will not be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom when Christ is king. Verse 18. Now, when Christ reigns in Jerusalem, verse 18 again, the trade of Tyre will be dedicated not to themselves, but to the Lord. Rather than hoard their merchandise, in verse 18, we're told that Tyre's goods will be a blessing to them that dwell before the Lord. Well, thank you for your patience as we've covered a lot of verses and a lot of uh, prophetic years in our study. And I, again, in many ways, we're laying a foundation we'll build on in the future as you grow in knowledge, not only of history, but the knowledge of the God of the word. God bless you and bye-bye.